Am I coming across on the microphone? I think I am, right? Okay. Uh, well, welcome everybody to the uh, gathering of the Shenandoah congregation in our phase one of uh, fully vaccinated hybrid service model. And uh, once again, uh, just as a reminder, so uh, anyone is welcome to uh, come to the church who has been fully vaccinated and share in services on site. Uh, However, that is uh, completely your choice and voluntary. For anybody who has not been fully vaccinated, uh, we are also in a hybrid mode uh, so that you can also join uh, from home or wherever you might be. And along those lines, wherever you might be, we welcome you here this morning to the gathering of the congregation. And while we might be in different places simultaneously, uh, we form one congregation, we worship together, and we are ministered to together this morning. Um, this morning's service, I will be presiding, and our speaker this morning will be Kathleen Cole. Uh, before we get to that, though, I have a few announcements to go over. First of all, um, uh, on the announcement slide, you might have noticed that there is a congregational YouTube channel. And you can go to that anytime you want. And it has recordings of our full services actually going all the way back to probably um, April of last year. Um, so, you know, you know, if you want to, if you want to just binge, uh, you can catch up from April all the way through to today on our YouTube channel. Uh, so, and then you can go to work or, or anywhere you go and just brag about, I was binging this weekend, uh, awesome stuff, but you can go to the YouTube channel. Also, it has snippets of the messages themselves pulled out of the services, as well as some other videos that we have shared. So feel free to go there. Um, the, uh, the link was on display here, uh, but it's not an, I won't say it's an easy link. It's a YouTube based link. And so it, like I said last week, it looks like a squirrel ran across the keyboard. Uh, so if you need that link, please let me know and I can provide that to you. Um, uh, in terms of things coming up this week, we have uh, Crafty Ladies. I'm going to go in chronological order. Crafty Ladies, Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. at Lila's house. So if you would like to participate in that, please see Lila and please head over there Tuesday morning, 10 a.m. Uh, that evening, then, is our weekly adult classes uh, that begin at 7 p.m. And those are online only. So you can use the same link that you used to join this morning's service to join the adult classes on Tuesday evening. If um, if you don't have that link, you can always go to uh, the congregational website, seaofchristsa.org, and click on the Join Zoom button. The following, so that's Tuesday night, and that is both for theology as well as Bible study class at 7 p.m. If uh, For Wednesday, then, Wednesday night is online game night at 7 o'clock p.m., and uh, Audrey and Addison will be hosting that for us, as they have so many times before. And uh, same thing, uh, join via the Zoom link. Following that, uh, at 8 a.m. or 8 p.m. on Wednesday night is uh, junior high, senior high class. Uh, and so, once again, join via the Zoom link. The, um, each week, we have... We raise prayer concerns and grateful news to the congregation. And in order to have your prayer concerns or grateful news um, submitted, you just need to reach out to Carol White by end of day Thursday in order to provide her with the information so that it will make it up onto the slide presentation as well as be brought up uh, at this time during Family of God. And uh, for prayer concerns, uh, we have uh, five uh, names being submitted this morning. Uh, first prayers for Donna and Edna and Ed, who have uh, tested positive for COVID. Um, they are doing well, but they are currently um, experiencing COVID symptoms. We also pray for Faye, who has been diagnosed positive with COVID and is in the hospital. And finally, uh, prayers for the uh, family and friends of Mandy W., uh, 
who recently passed away, and uh, she has two uh, young daughters. And so prayers for uh, the entire family, as well as all that are impacted by Mandy's passing. This morning, Kelly will be offering the prayer on behalf of the congregation. And uh, so I would ask that you bow your head with her as she offers a prayer. But I would also ask you to pray silently uh, along with her. If you'll bow with me, please. Our most kind and gracious heavenly parent, we come to you today to give you thanks and praise for all the many blessings you've given each and every one of us. We especially ask that you comfort the family and friends of Mandy W. Especially the two young children that she has. Let them feel your presence in their lives and let them know that you will be there for the rest of their lives. We'd also like for you to be with Samantha and Joe Jordan as they welcome their new baby Skylar into their family. She came to us a little early, so she'll be in the NICU for a little while. Another concern with that is Samantha tested positive for COVID. She can't even see her. So hopefully that will all get worked out and she'll get tested again, whatever your will be for that. And also continued prayers for Samantha and Zach as their life is continually changing. Sydney and Zach. Also, Lord, be with all of those currently experiencing COVID in any way, shape, or form. Edna and her son, Donna, all of their support team, and Faye, who's actually in the hospital, the staff. We are struggling right now with this COVID, and we all know that you're with us and will get us through. In the name of your most holy son, amen. And now we'll prepare for our service. Good morning once again, everyone. Uh, I, uh, I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, this morning. Uh, I am so happy that each of you uh, have made uh, the decision to join in worship this morning. Uh, we are all ministered to by each other's presence. Uh, we are ministered to by being able to see each other in whatever form uh, that takes. And uh, so uh, us to gather together uh, to worship. Uh, gather together to be ministered to and to provide ministry. Uh, it is a strengthening endeavor, and I appreciate each of you uh, for taking part in that. In this morning's service, we are going to have a unique service which will unfold uh, before you. And, um, and I look forward to our sharing. There will be more information uh, coming as we go through it. But I want to introduce also who will be involved in this morning's service. Um, we, I will be presiding as, as well as doing a couple of other things. Audrey and Addison will bring us our call to worship and our invocation. Uh, Lila Gardner will bring us a prayer of confession. Uh, Carol Burdick will bring us the disciples' generous response. And Kathleen Cole will share our focus moment as well as bring us our morning message. And I look forward to this time that we have together. And I look forward to each of us in our own way, having prepared for this morning service, uh, being enriched and leaving this hour together changed. At this time, Audrey and Addison Cole will bring us our call to worship. Creator of sunrises, comets, and trees, whose samplers of love is much grander than these. 
called forth by thy children, the colors of life that free us from laughter, that free us from strife. Forgive us the willful excesses of greed that screen from uncaring eyes those who have need. Though sharing be knowledge or service or bread, equip us with faith as in truth we are led. Forgive us the wreckage of hatred and war that sadden our soul and the innocent scar. Restore us to order of sunshine and trees and love that can make the earth grander than these. And now, please join us in singing hymn 145, Restless Weaver, led by the Beyond the Walls Choir. And if you're in person, please wear your mask. today as a church family to praise you and learn more about you. We thank you for the opportunity to gather in this time and in this place, both in person and online. Holy Spirit, please open our hearts and minds to the lessons you have us learn today, lessons about you and about ourselves. Be with each person gathered in your name today, again, both here in the sanctuary and in the homes of those joining this worship service virtually. We ask these things in your name, Jesus, amen.
Thank you, Audrey and Addison. Today's theme is when we lose our way. And uh, this Sunday, while it's, that's today's theme, uh, this Sunday is actually the first of a two-part series exploration of the story of King David and Bethesda from the 11th chapter of 2 Samuel. This chapter contains some potentially upsetting topics. Uh, it includes infidelity and sexual abuse. Uh, to be more blunt, it's a disturbing story of abuse on many levels. It is potentially so disturbing that an email was sent out yesterday to the congregation uh, inviting everyone to join this morning's service, but also allowing each person to make an informed decision of how they might want to do so. As always, uh, each of you, any member of the congregation is offered the option to join the service in person or online. Uh, in addition, however, if you feel that the subject matter might be triggering, uh, might be a triggering event for you, there is also the option to view the service after the fact on our congregational YouTube channel that I was speaking of earlier. Uh, in that approach, then you could process the discussion at your own pace. If you'd like to view the service that way, a link was provided in the email, uh, but if you need an additional assistance, you can always reach out to Kathleen or myself and we'll help you through that. So uh, the theme once again is when we lose our way and uh, with what I just said, one of the questions might be, why are we exploring this topic? Uh, as followers of Jesus, it's important to wrestle with uncomfortable topics that affect individuals and affect our society, uh, while also being sensitive to life's circumstances. To be a Christian is not always pleasant. We are not, uh, nor should we, expect to be isolated from the negative things around us. I have not found a promise in the scriptures anywhere that say Christians are excluded from the hardships of life. Our world is messy. At times, we ourselves create and contribute to that messiness. Over the next two Sundays, we will engage in and we will explore some of that messiness. The intention is not to be provocative but rather to openly discuss some of the horrible things humans can do to each other and how as Christians and as flawed human beings, we can respond not only from our world and our human perspective, but also from a theological perspective. How do we navigate through this messy world and do so in a way in which our theology serves as a compass? As we enter into this exploration, I would like to offer a centering prayer for peace for these services, as well as for our, our world as a whole. Please bow your head with me. Creator God, we long to feel your spirit of wholeness in our lives and for others. We pray for those who have experienced personal tragedies, spiritual, emotional, or physical. We pray for those who are suffering and do not feel supported. We pray for restoration of a sense of well-being to all those in need. May we carry the spirit of Christ's peace that abides in this worship space into our everyday lives and into the lives of others. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. At this time, we will now sing hymn number 314, When the Darkness Overwhelms Us, again, led by the Beyond the Walls Choir. Uh, for those in the sanctuary, please put on your mask during the singing of this hymn.
everyone. <clears throat> so today's theme is when we lose our way. I do want to just kind of pay back on a little bit of what Richard said. Um, I have to tell you, uh, <laughs> when we started preparing these services, I, I will tell you, I will admit, um, you know, we've been exploring the Old Testament for a while now. Um, for a few Sundays, and I will tell you, I really thought, really, the, <laughs> the the World Church Worship Helps want us to talk about this. They want us to dive into this. They want us. They want us to dwell in this. And and I got to tell you, I I was really tempted to just let's find a different scripture. <laughs> let's just not do this. Let's not go here. <laughs> and. Uh, and then the more I thought about it, the more um, 
we're being led here. We're being asked to dwell in this. We're being asked to examine this messiness. We're being invited to. And like Richard said, we can't avoid the messiness. So I, I did want to... I did want to kind of admit that before we start going in here, that I was very tempted to just sweep this under the rug and let's talk about something different. <laughs> but, but we're not. We're going to talk about this today. And I'm going to ease into it um, by sharing a children's story. So, uh, again, a couple of stories we're going to talk about. This is the first one. It's called... Uh, Ruthie and the Not-So-Teeny-Tiny Lie. Uh, life is full of choices, and in this book, the main character, Ruthie, is faced with several choices. So let's see what she chooses to do. Uh, you'll be able to see the, uh, the images at home and here in the, uh, in the sanctuary on the screen. I'm going to read it from the original book. <clears throat> Ruthie loved tiny things, tinier the better. Her toys were the teeniest imaginable. She had dinky dinosaurs, itty bitty trains, ponies no bigger than your pinky, and teddy bears that were barely there. Ruthie loved finding tiny treasures too at the beach. She searched for the smallest seashells. The flowers she picked were no bigger than fairy wings. She even had an eggshell from a hummingbird. And wherever Ruthie went, she carried some teeny thing in her pocket. One day at school recess, after jump rope and swing, Ruthie took a turn on the twirling bar. When she landed, she saw something in the grass. It was a little box with a teensy window and an even tinier button on top. She couldn't believe her luck. It was a teeny tiny camera. Ruby looked through its little window and she pressed the button on top to take a picture. But just like a real camera. This was absolutely the best thing Ruby had ever found. It was hers. She tried it out every which way. Say cheese, cloud. Click. Say cheese, little bug. Click. Say cheese, school. Click. Say cheese, Martin. Click. But Martin didn't think cheese. Martin said, hey, that's my camera. Ruby was startled. No, it's not. It's mine. Give it to me, said Martin. It's mine. It is not. It is too. No, it's not, shouted Ruthie, and she raced back into class. What's going on, asked Mrs. Olson. Ruthie's got my camera, cried Martin. I got it for my birthday, and I dropped it on the playground. But Ruthie wanted that teeny tiny camera. In the worst way. It's mine, she yelled. I got it for my birthday. Well, that wasn't true at all. Not one teeny tiny bit. Mrs. Olson looked at Martin. She looked at Ruthie. Goodness, this is a problem, she said. This camera can't belong to both of you. I'll keep it safe in my desk drawer for now. Let's talk about it again tomorrow. Ruthie's stomach flip-flopped the rest of the day. She couldn't remember the answer to two plus two. When Mrs. Olson read a story, every word flew straight out the window. The bus ride home took forever. Hi, Ruthie, Mama said. How was school? Okay, mumbled Ruthie. Dinner was macaroni and cheese, Ruthie's favorite, but she couldn't eat. Not one little bite. Aren't you, aren't you feeling well? asked Papa. I'm not hungry, she said. At, best, at bedtime, 
Ruthie was close to tears. What's the matter? asked Mama. So Ruthie told Mama and Papa the whole story. What do you think went wrong? asked Papa. I said it was my camera, Ruthie writes, but it's not. It'll be okay, said Papa. You made a mistake, and tomorrow you can fix it. I think Mrs. Olson and Martin will understand. But the next morning, Ruthie could barely eat. Maybe Mrs. Olson wouldn't understand. Maybe Ruthie would have to sit in the timeout corner. Maybe Martin would never talk to her again. Maybe no one would ever talk to her again. Not one teeny weeny word. The school bell was about to ring. Ruthie took a deep breath and began the long walk to the front of the classroom. Mrs. Olson's desk seemed very far away. Good morning, Ruthie, said Mrs. Olson. I have something to tell you, said Ruthie in a very small voice. The camera isn't mine. I didn't get it for my birthday. I found it on the playground. Mrs. Olson didn't make her sit in time out. She didn't even look mad. Instead, she gave Ruthie a hug and kissed the top of her head. Thank you for telling the truth, said Mrs. Olson. That took a lot of courage. I'm very sorry, Martin, said Ruthie. It's okay, said Martin. All at once, Ruthie's stomach stopped flip-flopping. She even skipped a little on the way back to her desk. She got the right answer to three plus seven in math, and after lunch, Mrs. Olson read the funniest story Ruthie had ever heard. And on the short bus ride home, Ruthie realized she didn't miss the teeny tiny camera. Not one teeny tiny bit. So, what were some of the choices Ruthie had to make? I'm asking you, and I'd love you to tell me. I'll repeat them so our folks at home can hear. What are some of the choices she had to make? Whether to tell the truth or not. Whether to tell the truth or not. Whether to tell the parent. Whether to tell the teacher. Maybe whether she was going to double down and stick to her story, just keep going with it. So this is a little easier story. Now we're going to get to the rougher one. Um, Ruthie's story dealt with lying, and this next story deals with some more life-changing and, quite frankly, traumatic circumstances. It comes from the 11th chapter of Second Samuel. I'm just going to read it, the first 15 verses. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanliness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. So David sent this word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite, and Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, how the war was going. 
Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. David was told Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, how did you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents. And my commander, Joab, and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, stay here one more day and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah out on the front where the fighting is fiercest, then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. Wow, pretty dark. There's a lot to unpack here. There's abuse of, a pow abuse of power, adultery, non-consensual sexual assault, lying, deceit, conspiracy, murder. There's a lot going on here. So let's just kind of go back through this and talk about some of these choices that David makes. First of all, let me give you a little bit of historical context about a few things. It was not unusual to be walking around on the roof at night, so David was not necessarily on the prowl when he was doing that. There was no AC at the time. It got hot inside, and in order to find some relief from the heat, people would go up to their rooftops and try to catch a cool evening breeze much easier to find that breeze up on the rooftop than down at street level. And it was also not unusual for someone to be bathing outdoors. They didn't have indoor plumbing. So Bathsheba bathing outdoors was not a provocative act. This was a common practice for both men and women. I think it could be argued that David's first problematic choice was when he sent someone to find out about her. Keep your nose into your own business. <laughs> this woman is just taking a bath outside. But when he, find out, when he found out that she was married to one of his most trusted soldiers, that's where it should have ended. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, right? But David chose to have her brought to him, and this was without a doubt the wrong choice. And he abused his position of power, because who's allowed to say no to the king? This leads to offense number two, that shalt, thou shalt not commit adultery. The text lets us know exactly what happened, but it uses some rose-colored rose language to kind of gloss over the trauma that takes place here. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. She did not come willingly. Let's call this what it is. It's a sexual assault. It's a rape. This is the first of many traumas that Bathsheba will endure. But I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Later, when she discovers that she's pregnant, she alerts David and, his, and this presents a problem for him. David is king. He is chosen and anointed by God. He has a reputation to uphold. Everyone knows her husband is off fighting in the war, and there are a number of messengers in David's palace who know what really happened. David is faced with another choice. Acknowledge what he has done or try to cover it up. And again, David makes the wrong choice. He sends for Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. Again, I need to provide a little context for this next session. Uh, when soldiers are sent into battle 
at this time, they take a vow of celibacy that lasts until the military campaign is completed. They commit themselves fully to the cause and they will not be distracted. So when Uriah appears before his king, David starts to small talk and then invites him to go home and wash your feet. This is coded language from that time. It means go home, get comfortable, get cleaned up, eat and drink, forget about the war. And the additional unspoken but understood message is, and sleep with your wife. We know that unspoken message was received because when David asked Uriah the next day why he hadn't gone home, as David had instructed him to, he answered, how could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? His fellow soldiers were still out fighting, and he knew that's where he should be too. David was trying to trick him. David was trying to cover up what he had done with Bathsheba. So his first attempt at a cover-up did not work, so the next attempt involved getting Uriah drunk. And again, trying to send him home to Bathsheba, but even in a drunken stupor, Uriah did not go home. David was running out of options and running out of time. So he made his worst choice of all. He decided to have Uriah intentionally killed on the battlefield. He sent Uriah back to the front line with his own signed and sealed death warrant, forcing his general... Joab, who, by the way, would not have been able to refuse an order from his king, yet another abuse of power, to participate in this murderous conspiracy. That's quite a rap sheet, right? A bit more consequential than picking up a camera on the playground and lying about who it actually belongs to. I have been focusing on David and his choices, but I'd like to take a step back and view this story from a different perspective for a moment. I'd like us to consider the trauma of Bathsheba. Here's a woman who was being faithful to her husband and faithful to her duties as a woman in the Israelite kingdom. She is purifying herself as she is expected to to do. When by no fault of her own, she falls under the gaze of a lustful king, drunk with his own power. He feels entitled to violate her. She has no voice to refuse him. She must endure the shame of becoming pregnant while her husband is away at war and then learns her husband has been killed. She is then taken as a wife by the very man who was responsible for the death of her husband and bears his son, only to have that son die days after he was born. As a woman living, little, uh, li- living in the 21st century now, I can hardly imagine what it must have been like to live in that time and to be viewed as little more than property. But there are other aspects of Bathsheba's life that I can relate to, and I wonder if you can too. Has there been a time in your life when choice has been taken from you or powers beyond your control have hurt you? or thrown your life into chaos. In spite of the trauma that she endures, Bathsheba later bears another son to David, Solomon, who becomes king after David's death. But that almost didn't happen. In the first chapter of First Kings, David is near the end of his life, and one of his other sons has proclaimed himself the new king. But Bathsheba becomes a vessel for God's voice, reminding David of his promise to anoint Solomon as the next king. Without her intervention, things would have turned out very differently. You know, every culture, every society has what I will call blind spots. Through the lens of history, we look back and say, wow, I, I can't believe that so-and-so or such-and-such was an acceptable thing. In this story, and really throughout the Bible, it's 
I can't believe it was acceptable for women to be treated as properly and routinely raped. The Old Testament is particularly brutal in its treatment of women. Bathsheba's is definitely not the only story of abuse and trauma of a woman. And the enslavement of servants of all genders and races was also common practice. So it makes me think, what are our blind spots today? You know we have them, right? (laughs) We can hardly be expected to recognize them. That's kind of the point. They're blind spots. We are blind to the poor choices that we make that bring hurt and harm to others. But I think it's our responsibility to continually look for them and be open to them being brought to our attention, even if it makes us uncomfortable or upset. Going back to the scripture passage for today, the books of First and Second Samuel are what could be called a community writing project. These stories were put together by many different writers and editors about 500 years after these events actually took place. The authors, along with the rest of the Israelites, were in captivity in Babylon trying to figure out what had happened to their kingdom. How did it all go so wrong? How did we lose it all? These writers, editors, if you will, would sometimes put in a little commentary here and there just to clarify the message they were trying to get across. In this scripture passage in verse 4, we have just been introduced to Bathsheba, and the authors feel it's important for the reader to know that she is bathing herself as part of her monthly purification process, which means that even if she weren't married, she would still be completely off limits to David because of her state of uncleanliness. Then, in the last line of chapter 11, which is actually toward the beginning of next week's scripture lesson as a follow-up to this week, In that last line of the chapter, just in case the authors haven't made their point strongly enough and the reader still has doubts about how completely messed up this is, the authors authors offer one final piece of commentary. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. David has made a bunch of bad choices here. And it begs the question, why was this story included in 2 Samuel? David was a heroic figure. Why include this story that completely trashes his reputation? I think we always have to remember that books included in the Bible were written at a fixed time and place in history. And they were usually written to appeal to a certain audience. This story is certainly not included in First and Second Chronicles, probably because the Chronicles have a much more pro-David perspective than First and Second Samuel. That's the audience that they were writing for. Recently, I heard someone talking about all of the different points of view and the outright contradictions that can be found throughout the Bible. They were comparing it to a faculty meeting where lots of different people with lots of different opinions and points of view are gathered in one room around one big table. They may be talking about the same general topic, but they all come from very different departments, if you will, different areas of expertise, and they have a lot of different things to say about this topic, whatever it is they're discussing. Heated discussions ensue. As an example, just within the Old Testament, the Deuteronomic writers believed that the sins of the father were passed down through the generations and that catastrophic things happened to sinful people generation after generation as a direct and divine punishment. But the 18th chapter of Ezekiel completely 
contradicts that belief. But for the authors of First and Second Samuel, this story of David and Bathsheba, along with several others about the later years of David's reign, serves as a warning to the Israelites. Be careful what you ask for. Almost as if the writers were saying, I told you so. Before David's predecessor, Saul, the Israelites had never had a king, only judges when a need arose for a temporary leader. But all the other nations around them seemed to have a king. I guess it was a fashionable thing to do at the time. Everyone else has a king. Why shouldn't we have one? Actually, the loose affiliation of tribes of Israel was finding that they could no longer defend themselves against more organized nations with centralized governments and superior military weapons. So when the people told the prophet Samuel they wanted a king, he warned them it would not go well. In the eighth chapter of 1 Samuel, he told them that a king would get carried away with his own power and turn away from God. He would take their sons and send them off to war. He would take their daughters as wives and concubines. And that's exactly what we are seeing happen to King David. But it's not all bad news. Even in the midst of all of these terrible choices and all the pain and trauma they caused, God never leaves David. Even when David no longer remains faithful to God, God remains faithful to David. God made a covenant with David, and despite his many transgressions, and although he himself suffered many consequences, Jesus, from the house of David, came to deliver the good news and show us the way many generations later. It's a glimmer of the unconditional love and grace that God has for each one of us. We always have the choice to right the ship, to return to the right path. Today is the first half of the story. I told Richard that, uh, that my part today of this two-part series was to be the wrecking ball. Uh, and his part next week is to show us how to clean it all up. Today we've heard how David made a huge mess with a string of terrible choices. But next week, we will hear about how he takes ownership of some of those choices and tries to repair some of the damage, how he chooses to return to God after he has lost his way. I'd like to leave you with a couple of questions to ponder this week. If you find yourself relating with Bathsheba and you are dealing with pain and chaos, how or with whom can you find hope and healing? And if you find yourself relating with David, grappling with the aftermath of some bad choices, how or through whom has God given you a way to find a new path? I would ask that you please join me at this time in the singing of hymn 212, God Weep, led by the Beyond the Walls Choir. And again, for those in the sanctuary, please put your masks on at this time. Trust. 
from Doctrine and Covenants, section 64, 6a. As revealed in Christ, God, the creator of all, ultimately is concerned about behaviors and relationships that uphold the worth and the giftedness of all people and that protect the most vulnerable. Such relationships are to be rooted in the principles of Christ-like love, mutual respect, responsibility, justice, covenant, and faithfulness, against which there is no law. Please silently pray with me as I offer this prayer of confession. God of compassion, your divine forgiveness compels us to offer this prayer. We know that we have fallen short of our best intentions to love as Jesus taught. We recognize We have not always been faithful to your teachings. Forgive us. We have not always acted with integrity, justice, or graciousness. Forgive us. Help us to more fully develop a deeper desire for reconciliation and healing of the spirit. Open our hearts and minds so that we might more clearly see the path toward faithfulness. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Let us continue our service with the singing of hymn 326, 326, In Christ We Live, led by the Cole Choir. Remember, if you're in the congregation, in the sanctuary, mask up.
generous response, we focus on aligning our heart with God's heart. Through our offerings, we're able to tangibly express our gratitude to God, who's the giver of all. The story of the feeding of the 5,000 in the sixth chapter of John is a wonderful example of being responsive to God's love. An enormous crowd had followed Jesus and his disciples because they had seen and heard Jesus performing miracles. They gathered to hear Jesus speak and teach, but food would be needed. Jesus asked, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? They didn't have a 7-Eleven back then. Down the, <laughs> the disciples had no idea how they were going to be able to provide for everyone who had gathered on the far shore of the Sea of Galilee that day. The disciple Philip said, well, it'll take more than a half a year's wages to even buy enough bread to provide one bite for each person. Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, brought forward a boy with five small barley loaves and two fish. The little boy offered what food he had out of a generous heart. Jesus used the little boy's example as he blessed the crowd. After everyone had eaten their fill, Jesus said, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. They filled 12 baskets with the leftovers. Even small acts of generosity can multiply to bless those with spiritual and physical needs. As we share our mission tithes today, either by placing money in the plates at the back of the sanctuary, by sending a check to Kathleen Cole through online giving available on our local website, seaofchristsa.org, or through e-tithing available on our World Church website, seaofchrist.org. Use this time to thank God for the many gifts received in your lives. Our hearts grow aligned with God's heart when we gratefully receive and faithfully respond by living Christ's mission. Would you please pray with me now as I offer a blessing over our gifts? Creator God, we give thanks for so many blessings, including our very lives. May we always um, remember the story of the little boy with five barley loaves and two fish who shared what he had. Great blessings can happen when we share, when we share generously. Our, our small gifts can multiply to help others. May we always be ready to reach forth our hand and, um, and be generous with our blessings. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As I stated earlier in the service, today has been the first of a two-part service series. Next Sunday, we will continue to explore the rest of David's story. One of the central aspects of our denomination and our theology is the grace of our heavenly parent and the unconditional love that is granted to us. In this coming week, I would challenge each of you to spend some time considering the times or the current time in your life when you have lost your way. I would encourage you to pray for the good spirit to accompany you in this self-awareness journey, all the while seeking and being fully aware of the Lord's affirmation of your word. Just as in the scripture study this morning, our lives get messy. And at times, we need to seek redemption. I invite you to return next week for the exploration of the rest of the scripture story and how it might apply in your life. As our closing hymn this morning, we will stand and sing hymn number 624, God of Grace and God of Glory, led by the Beyond the Walls Choir. If you are here in the sanctuary, please put on your mask for the singing of this hymn, followed by the benediction.
before you this morning. We are thankful for this hour that we have been able to share in together. We thank you, Lord, for those examples in which we can use them to reflect on our lives and identify times in which we are, have lost our way. Uh, we also, Lord, give you thanks for uh, the redemption that is available to us, even in the midst of those dark times. Be with us in the week to come that we might prepare again for the continuation of this story. He seems to pray in Christ's name. Amen. At this time, uh, we will unmute the lines online so that you can fellowship there. We won't be able to hear you here or engage with you there, but fellowship online and we will fellowship here in the sanctuary. Somebody forgot to flip a switch. When we were supposed to be singing hymn 326, I had total silence on my phone. Yeah, I think we all did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Hey, Sarah, Sarah. I'm Sorry sure it I was couldn't just be there today. Nancy didn't feel like making the trip. Well, we understand, Patrick. That's a long trip for you all, too, isn't it? Oh, yes, 125 miles. Yeah, that's a long trip. <laughs> that's one way. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think I knew that. How is she today? I know she hurt herself or something in the garden or. Oh, she was on the ride in the lawnmower. We still haven't figured out what she hit, but she took 20, uh, 22 stitches in her left arm. Wow. Well, I, is it getting better? It's healing. Yeah, oh, she's good. having trouble keeping the bandage on it now. It probably itches. <laughs> I'm sure it does. <laughs> well, thanks guys for everything. That was great. Yes, it was. It was very good. Have a good Sunday. Thank you. <laughs> you too. Take care. Okay. Bye. Bye bye. I'm going to sign off and hope to see y'all next Sunday. All right, Patrick, take care. Yeah. Just a minute. Hey, Jim. Hey, Carol. How are you? Yeah. All right, I'm going to sign off. Take care. Everybody, uh, I'm going to have to sign off now, but I uh, do want to say thank you for everybody being here. We'll see you.